Welcome to our sixth lecture. This week we start a new type of mathematics. This week we're going to start talking about combinatorics and probability. What is combinatorics? That's just a fancy way of saying counting. And that's how, we'll, how we will begin. We'll start with some easy counting methods. Chapter 17 will be quite basic, but then we'll move on to the the key ideas in chapter 18, where we talk about permutations and combinations. In the final chapter of today's lesson, we're going to do an introduction to probability. Next week we'll do more probability, but today we'll give an introduction. So, counting. We we'll start with the addition principle. If we have two sets A and B, how can we count the number of elements in A union B? We can count the number of elements in A and we can count the number of elements in B and we can add them together. But some elements we might be counting two times. We need to remove these extra counting, these extra, this extra number that we've counted twice. So the number of elements in A union B is going to be the number of elements in A plus the number of elements in B. And then so that we don't count things twice, we're going to be minus the number of elements in A into section B. A very easy example to start with. Let's suppose Ali has three yellow shirts and two blue shirts. How many shirts does Ali have? Well, that's easy. He has five shirts. Three plus two is five. Let's do this in terms of the, of the notation which we're going to be using. We're going to let S denote the set of Ali's yellow shirts and we're going to M denote the set of Ali's blue shirts. And then the number of elements of S union M will be the number of elements in S plus the number of units in M or 3 plus 2. Why is it 3 plus 2? Because a shirt can't be two colours, it can't be yellow and so we don't need to subtract anything. We're not counting shirts twice. Next example. In a college, there are eight students studying mathematics. There are 12 students studying physics. And there are five students who are studying chemistry and physics and mathematics. So how many students are studying either maths or physics? Now, at this time, there's an overlap of the two sets. Let M be the set of students studying mathematics, and let F be the set of students studying physics. Then there's going to be an overlap of these sets because some students will be studying mathematics and physics. So to answer this question, we're going to count the number of students doing maths. We're going to do plus the number of students who are studying physics. And then we'll subtract the number of students that we've been counting two times. If you remember the numbers from the question, those are 8, 12 and 5. So in total, there are 15 students who are studying either maths or physics. Our second basic principle is the, math, is the multiplication principle. Let's suppose we have two operations. Let's call them 01 and 02. Let's suppose that operation 01 could be done in n different ways, and operation 02 can be done in m different ways. Multiply these two numbers together, n multiplied by m. This is the number of possible ways that we could do 01 followed by 02. I'll show you a couple of examples. Let's suppose a man has five different shirts, three different ties, and two different pairs of trousers. In how many different ways can this person wear a shirt, a tie, and a pair of trousers? So two different trousers, so he's choosing the trousers first, and then he's going to choose one of his five shirts, and then after he's chosen a shirt, he has three different ties to choose. We're going to multiply these numbers together. Two different trousers, two different pairs of trousers, 
five different shirts and three different ties, multiply these numbers together, there are 30 different outfits that this person could choose. Another example. Four British cities called Aberdeen, Birmingham, Coventry and Derby are joined together by roads as I've shown in this picture. By how many different routes can a vehicle travel from Aberdeen to Derby without going back on itself? Well, straight away we can see that there are two possibilities. If we want to go from Aberdeen to Derby, we can either go through Birmingham or we can go through Coventry. If we go through B, then there's four different ways that we can go from A to B. And then from B to D, there's just one way. So if we look at the left picture, there are four multiplied by one different routes from A to D, which go through B. Next, let's look at the right picture. Now let's suppose we go from Aberdeen to Coventry and then from Coventry to Derby. There's two different ways to go from Aberdeen to Coventry. So two. And there's three different ways to go from Coventry to Derby. So three. Two multiplied by three gives six different routes. So with the left picture, there's four different routes. And in the right picture, there's six different routes. We're going to take these two numbers and we're going to add them together. In total, there are 10 different routes to go from A to D without going backwards. And one final example in this chapter. How many divisors does 2,800 have? Divisor is a, a whole number, a natural number, which will divide 2,800 and leave a whole number, leave a natural number. <clears throat> so the first thing to note is that if we factorize 2,800 into prime numbers, we get 2 multiplied by 2, multiplied by 2, multiplied by 2, multiplied by 5, multiplied by 5, multiplied by 7. To create a divisor of 2,800, we're going to be using some, but not all, of these numbers. First, let's look at the, number, the, the numbers 2. There's four twos, and we can use some of these or none of these twos in our divisor. We might choose to use all four of them, or use three of them, or use two of them, or use one of them, or use none of them. So we're going to use zero of them, one of them, two of them, three of them, or all four of these twos. There's five different possibilities for how many twos we're going to use. Then let's move on to looking at the fives. We might want to use both of these fives. We might choose to use only one of them, or we might use none of them. None of the fives, one of the fives, or both of the fives. There's now three choices of how many of the fives we use. And for the seven, either we use this or we don't use the seven. That means there's two choices here. So we have five choices multiplied by three choices multiplied by two choices. That means there's 30 different divisors of 2,800. 
And in fact, I've listed them at the bottom here. If you count these divisors, one, two, four, five, etc., all of the way up to 2,800, you will see that there are 30 numbers on this list. There's a general rule for questions like this. In general, suppose that P1, P2 up to Pn are prime numbers. And suppose that the number x is P1 to the power K1, P2 to the power K2, etc., up to Pn to the power Kn. Then x has K1 plus 1 multiplied by K2 plus 1, etc., multiplied by Kn plus 1 divisors. Okay, so that was our introduction to combinatorics. Now let's move on to the main ideas, permutations and combinations. In this chapter, we're gonna be using things called factorials. And the way that we write a factorial is using an exclamation mark after a number. This means the product of the first n natural numbers. Here we go. Here we go. n factor means n multiplied by n minus 1, multiplied by n minus 2, multiplied by n minus 3, etc. Multiplied by 3, multiplied by 2, multiplied by 1. For the number 0, we need to invent something which makes sense. And defining zero factorial to be equal to one makes sense. Now, factorial has the property that n factorial is always equal to n multiplied by n minus one factorial. Some examples, four factorial means 4 multiplied by 3 multiplied by 2 multiplied by 1 equal to 24. 7 factorial divided by 5 factorial means 7 multiplied by 6 multiplied by 5 multiplied by 4 multiplied by 3 multiplied by 2 multiplied by 1 divided by 5 factorial. But this part, 5 multiplied by 4 by 3 by 2 by 1 is just the same as 5 factorial. That cancels with 5 factorial on the bottom, we just end up 7 multiplied by 6, or 42. And the sort of thing that we would be doing in this chapter, as you will see soon, 52 factorial divided by 5 factorial, 47 factorial. I'll leave this for you to check. It's 2,598,960. Now, no, factorial, n factorial grows very rapidly. 5 factorial is 120, but 10 factorial is over 3 million. Just going from 5 to 10, and we've got jumped up a lot. Jump up another 5 to 15 factorial, and we're over a British billion or an American trillion. Right, let's move on to talking about permutations. Imagine that you have four pictures and you're going to arrange them on a wall in a line. How many different ways are there to arrange them? Well, you could arrange them like this. Let's suppose these are your four pictures. Bugs, Bunny, Daffy Duck, Taz and Tweeter. This will be one. Or we might swap the position of the last two pictures. Arrangement two could be Bugs, Daffy, Tweety, Taz. Or number three, we might do Bugs, Taz, Daffy, Tweety. Or Bugs, Taz, Tweety, Daffy. Or Bugs, Tweety, Daffy, Taz, etc. How many different ways are there to do this? I'm not going to list them all. 
Now think about this. For the first picture, we have four pictures to choose from. We're going to choose one of these four pictures and we're going to put it in the left picture frame. So four choices here. And then let's move on to the second picture frame. Now we've got three pictures left. We can choose one of these three pictures to put here. Let's suppose that we put Taz just here. So far, we've got four multiplied by three choices. And then we move on to the third picture frame. There's two pictures left to choose from. We can either put Bugs Bunny in or we can put Daffy Duck in. So we've got two choices. Let's say we put Daffy in. Now that's four multiplied by three multiplied by two different ways so far. And then finally, we come to the fourth picture frame and we've only got one picture left. We've only got one choice now. So it must be four multiplied by three multiplied by two multiplied by one. Different ways to arrange these pictures. There's four factorial or 24 different ways to hang our pictures in a line. This idea of rearranging things is called a permutation. A permutation of a set of distinct objects is an arrangement of the, or, of the objects in a specific order Without, repet without repetition, without repeating ourselves. We can only use each object one time. We have notation for the number of permutations of n distinct objects without repetition. Two ways to write it. We can write n p n or we can write p bracket n comma n. In this course, I'm going to be using the first notation. And a theorem, we probably understand this already from the previous example, npn is equal to n factorial. If I had three pictures to arrange, there were three factorial different ways to arrange them. If I have four different pictures, there are four factorial different ways to arrange them. If I had five pictures, there would be five factorial different ways to arrange them. Now let's make this a little bit more sophisticated. Now again, let's suppose you have four pictures, but you only want to hang two of them on your wall. How many different ways are there to hang two out of four pictures? <clears throat> this time I can list them all. Bugs and Daffy, Bugs and Taz, Bugs and Tweety, Daffy and Bugs, Daffy and Taz, Daffy and Tweety. Taz and Bugs, Taz and Daffy, or Taz and Tweety, Tweety and Bugs, Tweety and Daffy, Tweety and Taz. This is all the different ways we could do this. There's 12 different ways. How could we calculate that without having to make a list of all of the possible ways to do this? Let's go back to the previous idea got two picture frames and we want to fill them with our pictures. For the left picture frame, we have got four different choices. We can either put Bugs or Taz or Daffy or Tweety here. Let's say that we put Bugs here, that we put Daffy here. And then we move to the second picture frame. There's three different pictures left. We're going to choose one of these. Let's suppose we choose Bugs. There's four multiplied by three or 12 different ways to, to hang two pictures out of four without repetition if the order is important in a specific order. How can we write this in terms of n factorial? So we have 12 or four multiplied by three. 
Note that that's the same as 4 multiplied by 3 multiplied by 2 multiplied by 1 divided by 2 multiplied by 1. Because, of course, the 2 and the 1, we could cancel top and bottom. So we can think of 12 as 4 factorial divided by 2 factorial. A permutation of a set of n distinct objects, taking r at a time without repetition, is an arrangement of r of the n objects in a specific order. The number of such permutations we're going to call npr. p for permutation, n is the total number of objects that we have, r is how many of them we're using at that time how many we're taking from the total number of objects. So for example, let's suppose we have three objects, and it, I'm going to call these objects A, B, and C, and suppose that we take R of these objects. Then these are the possible permutations. First of all, let's suppose we only take one of the three objects. We could take A, or we could take B, or we could take C. So there are three P1, or three different permutations. Now let's look at the middle column. Again, we've got three objects, but now we're going to take two of the objects. We could take AB or AC or BA or BC or CA or CB. There's six different ways to take two objects from three if the order is important. If the order is important, then AB is not the same as BA. And then finally, let's look at the right column. Let's suppose we could take all three of the objects. We could take ABC, ACB, BAC, BCA, CAB, or CBA. Again, there's six different permutations of three objects taken from a total of three objects. What's the formula for this? The number of permutations of n distinct objects taken r at a time without repetition is npr. The formula is n factorial divided by n minus r factorial. Let's do an example using this formula. I have written the formula at the top. For example, find the number of permutations of 16 objects taken three at a time. So in total, we have 16 objects, and we're going to take three of them. So the example is asking us to calculate 16p3. Put the number 16 and 3 into our formula, calculate it, and we get 3,360. So that's permutation. The second idea in this chapter is the idea of combinations. Let's talk about the Turkish National Lottery. To enter this, you need to choose six numbers from a total choice of 49 numbers. So the question is, how many different ways are there of choosing six objects from 49 objects? The first thing to note is the answer is not 49p6, because this time the order of the numbers does not matter. For example, if you're playing the lottery, and if the numbers 28, 16, 9, 7, 35, and 47 come out of the lottery machine, that's just the same as if the numbers 7, 9, 16, 28, 35, and 47 come out of the lottery machine. 
This is not a permutation because now the order of the objects does not matter. This is called a combination. A combination of a set of n distinct objects, taking r at a time, without repetition, is an r element subset of, a, of the set of n objects. The arrangement of the elements in the subset does not matter. We have three notations for the number of combinations of n distinct objects taken r at a time. I'm going to be using the notation NCR. You may have seen bracket N over R bracket or CNR at school or in maths books before. So for example, let's suppose again that we have three objects and let's suppose these three objects are called A, B and C. And suppose that we take R of these objects. What are the possible combinations? Left column, first of all. Let's suppose we take one of these three objects. What are the different possibilities? We can either take A, or we can take B, or we can take C. So there's three different combinations here. 3C1 is equal to 3. Next, let's look at the middle column. How many different ways are there to take two of the three objects? We could take AB, we could take AC, or we could take BC. Now, because the order doesn't matter, AB is the same as BA. So there's really only three different possibilities. There's three different combinations of three objects taken two at a time. 3C2 is equal to three. And then finally on the right column, how many different ways can we take three objects from three objects? There's only one way, we take all of them. 3C3 is equal to one. What is the formula for the number of combinations? Here it is. It's almost the same as the previous one, but we have this extra term on the bottom. NCR, the number of combinations of n distinct objects taken r at a time without repetition, is n factorial divided by n minus r factorial multiplied by r factorial. Let's do an example or two examples using this formula. I've written the formula at the top. A collector has 20 different coins. So straight away, n must be 20. How many different ways can six coins be collected? R must be six. So what we're asked to is we're, we're asked to calculate 20C6. Put the numbers 20 and 6 into our formula. I'll leave this for you to check at a later time. Please check that, there's no mistakes here, please check that 20C6 is 38,760. Now we're ready to answer the lottery question. How many different ways are there to choose six numbers from a total of 49 numbers? 49C6. Put the numbers 49 and 6 into the formula. Calculate it and what we find is 13,983,816. This is the, the number of different lottery combinations. So let me just recap. We've talked about permutations and combinations. The formula for the number of permutations is n factorial over n minus r factorial. The formula for the number of combinations is n factorial over n minus r factorial multiplied by r factorial.
from a group of nine people, in how many ways can a chairperson, a vice chairperson and a secretary be elected? If we assume that one person cannot hold more than one position. <clears throat> and part two, in how many different ways can we choose a committee of three people? Let's answer question one first of all. We have nine people. We need to choose a chairperson, a vice chairperson and a secretary. First, let's choose the chairperson. There's nine different choices here. We can choose any of these nine people. And then we move on to choosing the vice chairperson. That needs to be a different person. So now there's eight different people we can choose from. And then finally, we're going to choose the secretary. Seven different people left. So there's going to be seven different choices for secretary. There's nine multiplied by eight multiplied by seven or 504 different ways to do this. Or we can answer this problem using permutations. We were asked really for 9p3, the number of ways of choosing three people from nine if the order is important, if the order matters. And that's just nine factorial divided by nine minus three factorial or 504. Now let's talk about part two. Now we want to choose a committee of three people from these nine people. When we're choosing a committee the order doesn't matter. So if the order doesn't matter, we use combinations. The number of ways to choose a committee of three people from a total of nine people is going to be 9C3 or 84. Permutations and combinations are similar in one respect in that we don't allow repetition. You can only use each object one time. But there is one important difference between them. In a permutation, the order is important. In a combination, the order is irrelevant. The key idea, the key thing that you need to learn from this section is when do we use permutations and when do we use combinations? Let's talk about cards. Standard deck of cards has 52 cards. That's 13 hearts, 13 clubs, 13 diamonds and 13 spades. And the cards go ace, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, jack, queen, king. Question one, how, oh, I should also explain, what does the word hand mean? When you play cards, you're given some cards which you hold in your hand. This is called a hand of cards. So question one, how many five card hands have two kings and three aces? In other words, how many ways can we get five cards which have two kings and three aces? How many five card hands or five card collections or five card sets, whatever word you want to use, have two clubs and three hearts? How many three ha card hands have all cards from the same suit? Let's do question one first of all. This time we're going to need to use the multiplication principle and combinations. In our five cards, we need to have two kings. In total, there's four kings, king of cards, king of clubs, king of diamonds, and king of spades. 
And from these four kings, we're going to be choosing two. How many different ways are there of choosing two from four, if the order doesn't matter, four C2? And then we need to get three aces. In total, in the pack of cards, there's four aces. So we're going to be choosing four, we're going to be choosing three aces from a total of four. How many different ways are there of choosing three from four? Four C three. Then we come to the multiplication principle. We need to multiply these two numbers together. We're going to be doing 4C2 multiplied by 4C3. And I'll leave for you to check that that is equal to 24. There's 24 different ways of getting five cards, which includes two kings and three aces. How many five card hands have two clubs and three hearts? How many different ways can we get five cards? And in those five cards, we've got two clubs and we've got three hearts. First of all, how many different ways are there of getting two clubs? In a deck of cards, there's 13 clubs in total. So there's 13 C2, different ways of getting two clubs. <coughs> How many different ways are there of getting three hearts? 13 C3. Multiply these two numbers together. There's 22,308 different ways or different hands which have two clubs and three hearts. How many free card hands have all cards from the same suit? Let's first of all talk, just talk about hearts. In the deck of cards, there's 13 hearts in total, and we want to get three of these hearts. From a total of 13 hearts, we want to choose three of these hearts. So 13 C3 or 286. Similarly, there's going to be 286 hands having all clubs, 286 hands having all diamonds, and 286 hands having all spades. Add these together, or do 4 multiplied by 286, we get our answer. 1,144. Another example. A bag contains two white balls and three red balls. In how many ways can three balls be chosen if at least one ball must be white? So what are the possibilities? If at least one of the balls must be white, then either we have two white balls, so one white ball and two red balls, that's one possibility, or we might have two white balls and three and one red ball. We don't want to have all of three red balls because we want to have at least one white ball. How many different ways are there to get one white ball and two red balls? One white out of two is two choose one. Two red out of a total of three is three choose two. How many different ways are there to get two white balls and one red ball? For the two white balls, it's two choose two. And for the one red ball, three choose one. Add these together. 
2C1, 3C2, plus 2C2, 3C1. Calculate it and we get our answer. There's nine different ways. Next example. You have one red ball, one blue ball, one green ball, and three orange balls. The three orange balls are identical. How many visually different ways are there to arrange the balls in a line? Now the first thing to note is if we had six different colours, then this would be a very easy question. There's six P6 different ways to arrange six different balls in a line. But this time we've got three balls of the same colour. So the correct answer is going to be smaller than this. For example, if we label our balls as R, B, G, O1, O2 and O3, then these two look the same. RG, O1, O2, B, O3 looks the same as R, G, O2, O3, B and O1 because the orange balls all look exactly the same. But if we did 6P6, we would be counting this arrangement twice. And we don't want to, we only want to count this once. So let's ask, how many different ways are there to arrange these orange balls? And the answer, of course, is there's 3P3 equal to 6 different ways. That means that if we were to calculate 6P6, we're going to be, a calculate, we're going to be counting each arrangement six times. So the answer to this problem is actually 6P6 divided by 3P3. There's 6P6 ways to arrange the balls in a line, but if we did that, we would count, be calculating, we would be counting each arrangement six times, so we divide by six, and we get 120. Let's do another example like this. In how many different ways can the letters of the word mathematics be arranged such that the vowels are consecutive? In other words, such that the vowels are all next to each other. So what do we have? In mathematics, the letters are M, A, T, H, E, M, A, T, I, C, and S. Of these 11 letters, there's four vowels. The vowels are A, E, A, and I. And we need these four vowels to always be next to each other, or always be consecutive. So what we're going to do is we're going to think of these vowels as one object for now. In other words, we're going to think that the objects that we have are MTH, MTCS, and then all of the vowels. So what we're going to do is we're going to think that we only have eight objects and we're going to talk about how many different ways can we arrange these eight objects. Of these eight objects we've got two M's, two T's, one H, one C, one S and one vowels. If these eight objects were all different, there would be 8p8 ways to arrange them. But they're not all different. We've got two m's and we've got two t's, so we need to divide by something. To take care of the two m's, we divide by 2p2. To take care of the two t's, we also divide by 2p2. So the answer is 8 factorial divided by 2 factorial multiplied by 2 factorial. That's 10,080. We're not finished yet. We also need to talk about how we can rearrange the vowels. 
A, E, A and I all need to be next to each other, but they don't always have to be in this order. We might have A, A, E, I or E, I, A, A, etc. All the different ways. How many different ways are there to arrange these vowels? If these four vowels were all different, there would be four P4 different ways to arrange them. But they're not all different. We've got two A's. So to take care of that so that we don't count the same arrangements more than once, we divide by two P2. Two A's from a total of two A's. That means there's 12 different ways to arrange the vowels. If we multiply these two numbers together, we're going to get the answer to this question. 10,080 multiplied by 12 gives us 120,960. That's the number of different ways to arrange the letters of mathematics, which satisfy the rule that all of the vowels are consecutive. You won't be allowed a calculator in the exams, but it might be useful for you when you're doing the homework. Have a look at your calculator if you've got a scientific calculator and find the permutations and combinations functions. On this calculator, this Casio calculator, they're written as NPR and NCR and they're on the multiplication and division buttons. In my opinion, the best it's not allowed in the exam. You're allowed to use calculators for homework, of course. In my opinion, the best website calculator or the best mobile phone, best smart app for mathematics is Wolfram Alpha. And in Wolfram Alpha, you could type seven permutri or seven choose three. Our final chapter for today is an introduction to probability. Most of the probability we study we'll be talking about next week, but let's do an introduction now. If you roll a, a single die, that's a standard six-sided die, what are the possible outcomes? We can get a 1, a 2, a 3, a 4, a 5, or a 6. The set of these possible outcomes is called a sample space, and each one of the numbers in S is, are called, is called a simple event. Now let's suppose that we want to roll an even number. How can we roll an even number with this die? We would have the subset containing two, four, and six. This is called a compound event. The set S of, is called a sample space of for some experiment if it satisfies two rules. The set contains all of the possible outcomes and one and only one of these outcomes in S must occur. An event is any subset of S. And here we're including the empty set and S itself as events. EI in S is a simple event. If capital E is the subset containing just one simple event, it's still called a simple event. If the subset E contains more than one element, then it's called a compound event. Now let's suppose that we have two dice. We're going to roll two dice. What are the possible outcomes? The first die, which I'm calling them, which I've drew, drawn in blue, could be one, two, three, four, five, or six. And the second die I've drawn here in red could also be one, two, three, four, five, and six. These are all the different outcomes of rolling two dice. For example, if we're rolling two dice, then the sample space is the set containing all of the pairs A and B, 
where A and B are numbers between 1 and 6. What is the event which corresponds to a total score of 7? What is the event which corresponds to a total score of 3? What is the event which corresponds to a total score greater than 10? What is the event which corresponds to a total score of 2? First of all, how can we get a total score of 7? We could do 1 and 6, or 2 and 5, or 3 and 4, or 4 and 3, or 5 and 2, or 6 and 1. How could we get a total score of 3? We could do 1 and 2, or 2 and 1. How could we get a total score greater than 10? What is the event which corresponds to a total score greater than 10? We could do 5 and 6, that gives 11, or 6 and 5, that gives 11, or 6 and 6, which gives 12. And what is the event which corresponds to a total score of 2? We would have to have 1 and 1. That's the set containing just the simple element 1 and 1. These first three are compound events because they contain more than one element. The fourth one is a simple event because it just contains one element. <clears throat> Let's suppose we have a sample space with n simple elements. The probability of event EI is a real number which we call P of EI. And there's two rules that we must satisfy for probability. The probability of EI must be a number between 0 and 1. And if we add these probabilities all up, we must get 1. Let's think about flipping a coin. Let's suppose we're flipping a coin. Let's suppose it's a fair coin. Then the sample space is either heads or tails. And if it's a fair coin, we can assume that the probability of heads is a half, and we can assume that the probability of getting tails is also a half. Note that both of these probabilities are between 0 and 1, and if we add them together, we get 1. If we flip this coin a thousand times, we'd expect to get heads roughly 500 times. Not, probably not exactly 500, but we would expect to get it roughly 500 times. The probability of an event E, which we call P of E, must satisfy these four rules. If E is the empty set, then the probability of E must be zero. If E is the whole sample space, then the probability of E must be 1. If E is a simple event, then the probability of capital E must be the same as the probability of EI. And if capital E is a compound event, then P of E must be equal to the sum of the probabilities of all of the simple elements in E. If the probability of an event is 1, that means the event is certain to occur. If the probability of an event is 0, that means that the event will never occur. Let's go back to coins. Let's suppose we have two coins now. We're going to be flipping these two coins. And now the sample space, that's all of the possible outcomes, 
contains the elements heads, 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 tails, tails, heads, and tails, tails. And we're going to assume that these are all equally likely. So we're going to assume that the probability of each of these is a quarter. Five questions. What is the probability of getting one head and one tail? What is the probability of getting at least one tail? What is the probability of getting at least one head or at least one tail? What is the probability of getting two tails? What is the probability of getting three tails? Part one, first of all, what is the probability of getting one head and one tail? How can we get one head and one tail? We could have heads, tails, or we could have tails, heads. The probability of our compound event will be probability of heads, tails, plus the probability of tails, heads. A quarter plus a quarter or a half. How could we get at least one tail? Heads tails has at least has one tail. Tails heads has one tail. And tail tail has two tails. Two is bigger than one. Add these probabilities up. A quarter plus a quarter plus a quarter, we get three quarters. The probability of getting at least one tail is three quarters. What is the probability of getting at least one head or at least one tail? Heads heads, that has at least one head, we'll keep that one. Heads tails has at least one head. Tails head has at least one head. And tail tail has at least one tail. We want all of these. We have the whole sample space, and the probability of the whole sample space must always be equal to 1. What is the probability of getting two tails? A quarter. What is the probability of getting three tails? That's not possible. We can't get three tails if we only have two coins. Our event is the empty set, empty set and the probability of the empty set is equal to 0. If we assume that each simple event in S is equally likely, then the probability of an event E is going to be the number of elements in E divided by the number of elements in S. So back to two dice. Suppose we're rolling these two dice and suppose that each simple event is equally likely. In other words, we're going to suppose that we have fair dice. Find the probabilities of the following. A total score of 7, a total score of 3, a total score of greater than 10, a total score of 2. We've already thought about the compound events for each one of these possibilities. For a total score of seven, we've seen that our event is the subset containing one, six, two, five, three, four, four, three, five, two, and six, one. How many elements are in here? The six elements in this set. How many elements are there in the whole sample space? There's 36 elements in the whole sample space because the first die has six possible outcomes and the second die also has six possible outcomes. Six multiplied by six is 36. So the probability of getting a total score of seven must be one divided by six. How can, what is the probability of getting a total score of three? We could have either one, two, or we could have two, one. There's two elements in here. So we're going to be doing two divided by 36. What is the probability of getting a total score greater than 10? 
we can have 5, 6, 6, 5, or 6, 6. There's three elements in our compound event, so we're going to be doing 3 divided by 36. How could we get a total score of 2? There's only one way to get a total score of 2. We would have to roll 1 on both dice. So now we're doing 1 divided by 36. One final example. You randomly draw five cards from a standard deck of 52 cards. What is the probability of getting two clubs and three hearts? The first thing to ask is, how many different ways are there of choosing five cards from a total of 52? We know this, we talk, we've done our combinatorics, there's 52 C3, different ways to get five cards from a total of 52. We've already seen that there are 13 choose 2 multiplied by 13 choose 3, different ways to get five cards which have two clubs and three hearts. So what we're doing here is the number of elements in E divided by the number of elements in S. 13 C2 multiplied by 13 C3 divided by 52 C5. If you have a calculator, you can calculate these numbers and you can find the answer. If this was an exam question, we, don't, we wouldn't expect you to get to the end of this. We would expect you just to finish here. And that is the end of this week's lesson. Next week, we will finish studying probability. Concepts of probability, conditional probability, and probability trees. I'm now ready to answer your questions.